Please turn again in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. If you're using the Pew Bibles this morning, this is on page 1029. Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, The words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Yet you have still a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let us pray. Father, as we've just read this sobering message from your son to the church in Sardis, we, we thank you for a revelation like this. We thank you for letters like this. We thank you for uh, giving us an opportunity to think through what Jesus says to his church. Lord, as we've continued on in this series, uh, looking at these different churches in Revelation, we ask that we, as a local church, would, would look at what Jesus commands and look at Jesus, what he censures, and then be striving for that which he says is good and commends, and seeking by your grace to avoid what he censures. And Father, uh, these are letters to churches, ultimately, but we also know, always at the end of these letters, Jesus says, He who has an ear, the individual, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So as we're here this morning and we hear these things, and yes, we think about church and an assembly and a whole group of people, but also let us as individuals contemplate what Jesus says. And if there be anyone here this morning who's never received your Son, as Lord and Savior, please uh, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches and bring them to a saving faith in your Son, Jesus Christ. We ask this in his name. Amen. Amen. I recently saw this quote from Elon Musk, noted theologian. <laughs> He's an atheist. Uh, I do zero market research whatsoever. We don't even have a marketing department or advertising. It's just like, what would be a great car or great rocket? I try to think of what is the platonic ideal of the perfect rocket or car. What characteristics would it have? And then make that. I find that if you do that, people want to buy it. He's been fairly successful by doing just that. Uh, that's fascinating to me that at least in 2019, Elon Musk says, I do no advertising. I don't know if that's still the case today, but that's when this quote was, was made. But what I want you to notice is the idea that he had and, and what he says with that. I try to think of what is the platonic ideal of the perfect rocket or car. What characteristics would it have? And then make that. I find if you do that, people want to buy it. And you're all thinking, well, okay, very nice. What's that have to do with the passage that we're in this morning? Two things. One, if we try to apply this kind of thinking to the church, just try to imagine in our own minds, what would the perfect church be like? People do that, actually. Uh, if we just do it in our own minds, we also might fail miserably. Other people might think if, if, if we came up with just this great idea, this great new thing on, well, what should the church be like? 
Other people around us might think, wow, that is a great church. But then the words from Jesus might also come. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. You certainly don't want that. So that's number one. If we try to apply that kind of thinking to the church, we might fail miserably. Number two, though, I do think that Musk's general idea of finding out what he calls the platonic ideal and then shooting for that is helpful. I'll explain that in a, in a moment. Uh, probably since about the 1980s, late 1980s, one segment of the evangelical church has emphasized the technique of advertising and marketing and just, just doing surveys of people like in, in the area to find out what do they want in the church. And then once they find that out by doing surveys, then they say, well, let's just do that. This is what people want. This is, let's just do it. But what about instead of asking, what do people want and let's do that, what about we ask, what is the ideal church and shoot for that? And unlike Elon Musk, instead of just trying to imagine our own heads, now what would be? So the leadership of the church, maybe we could sit around some night and just say, what would be the ideal church? Well, let's just shoot for that. We don't have to imagine it. We don't have to come up with that on our own. That's really what we're seeing in this series on Revelation. We see objectively in black and white in the scripture what the head of the church, Jesus Christ, what he says, I commend this. This is good. Good job. This is what I want my church to be like. This characteristics you have, way to go. We have that in black and white in the pages of Scripture, so we don't have to imagine it. We can look to Scripture and see, here's what the head of the church says. This is good. Let's shoot for that. Uh, we also see in these letters to the seven ancient churches of Asia, we also see what Jesus, the head of the church, censures. What he says, I have this against you. So again, we don't have to imagine it. We don't have to imagine what this platonic ideal is. We have Jesus himself telling us, it's not a platonic ideal, but we have Jesus himself telling us, here's what I commend, here's what I censure, and if we know the head of the church says, yes, I commend this, these are characteristics that are, are great, then that's what we shoot for. And if the head of the church says, these are characteristics that I, I condemn and I have this against you, well, then we know to flee that as well. We can hear from the head of the church all these things, and we can shoot for these qualities, and by his grace, seek to avoid other characteristics and qualities. That's the whole point of this series. I wouldn't say the whole point, but as we're in this portion of Revelation, I've, I've labeled these passages. This isn't unique to me. Other commentaries have, have even this title, but... What does Christ think of his church? That's to me what's so exciting about each one of these seven letters that we have before us here in Revelation. And there's a certain format that each one of these letters that Jesus addresses to the churches that he goes through. And, and we can ask questions based upon this format to find out what does Christ think of his church. And that's what we've been doing. That's what we do today as well. First question is, who is this Christ that we're hearing from? Why don't you look down in your Bibles to Revelation 3 and Revelation 3 verse 1. Who is this Christ we're hearing from? We ask this of each of the letters. Again, we ask it of this letter to Sardis. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars been a little while since we've looked at this but remember what it means or what it's pointing to when Jesus speaks of the seven spirits of God it refers to the Holy Spirit 
And as we worked through this earlier in Revelation chapter 1, verse 4, it seems like one reason for the Holy Spirit to be described in this way is that seven is the number of completeness. And that's an element here as the Holy Spirit is being described. It sounds very strange to us, but John uses the same terminology elsewhere in Revelation. Revelation 1 verse 4, we saw that already here in 3 verse 1. Again in Revelation 4 verse 5. And again in Revelation 5 verse 6. And, and it, especially in 5 verse 6, why don't you turn over there in your Bibles. As we see John use this terminology again in describing the Holy Spirit, we get a little better sense as to the significance of that description. Why, why would it be used to describe the Holy Spirit in this way? Revelation chapter 5, verse 6. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Uh, I, I'm not going to develop this in great detail this morning because I, I really want to focus more on what Christ thinks of the church. But I, I want you to note this connection in verse Revelation chapter 5, verse 6, between the seven eyes and the seven spirits of God that is said it's sent out into all the earth. So what? I take it when, when Jesus, he's the lamb here, when he's described in this way, this terminology is, de, uh, is derived from Zechariah chapter 4, verse 10. If you're very fast in flipping your Bible... You can get back there to Zechariah, but let me read it for you. Zechariah 4, verse 10. It says this, For whoever has despised the day of small things shall rejoice and shall see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. These seven eyes are the eyes of the Lord which range through the whole earth. So when it has this, this idea of seven eyes, which Revelation 5, verse 6 talks about. And then it says those are the seven spirits of God. I take it this terminology pictures the complete nature of the Holy Spirit's knowledge of everything that's happening on the earth. These seven are the eyes of the Lord which range the whole earth. I take it here, the point is at the start of the letter, when Jesus describes himself in this way, and when he says, I have the seven spirits of God, the point is he has complete knowledge of everything that is going on in the earth, everything that is going on in that church. He knows what's going on there. He knows motives. He knows the heart. And that's all happening there. What we see in Revelation, when Jesus says what he says, it's not, he's not guessing. He's not wondering. He's not speculating. He knows it. And when he says, I know your works, it's exactly how things are. That's, I take it, why he brings out here this description of himself. Turn back to Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, the words of him who has the seven spirits of God... So we just noted that. Uh, he has perfect knowledge of what's really going on in the church. Despite his reputation, skip to the end of the verse where he says, I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, a name for being alive, but you are dead. The reputation that can sometimes fool a lot of different people. And, and we, we sometimes have this saying, I don't know, different advertisements that say, uh, image is everything, not to the Lord. Reputation or image, that, that isn't everything. There's reputation, there's image, and then there's reality. And since Jesus holds the seven spirits, he knows reality. There, there's no fooling him, there's no getting by just a reputation or anything like that. Uh, I, I guess just a word in passing as we think about that aspect of who is writing here. 
Jesus and how he's describing himself here. It's important to remember as a local church. Um, I, I read and hear stories, uh, too many stories, of, of churches that uh, in, in some cases we'd be very like-minded with and they, they seem great on the outside, but then you start hearing about the inner workings of the churches and how people are treated in different churches and just lots of muck, I guess I'd say. If nothing else, this description of Jesus, I have the seven spirits of God. It's a reminder that even if no one else sees, even if no one else knows, uh, nothing gets outside of the good reputation. If, if the reputation isn't reality, Jesus knows reality. You can't fool him. You can't get away from things. You can't disguise things. He knows it all. And it's to him who we will give an account. Of course, we're all still sinners and we all fail. But uh, it's, I think, just an important reminder when we're thinking of this idea of the, the letters to the churches. He knows. He knows. And we are accountable to him. Jesus describes himself as the one who has the seven spirits of God. Revelation 3, verse 1. He also describes himself as he has the seven stars. Seven stars. We already looked at this in our study of Revelation. Uh, why don't you look back to Revelation chapter 1, verse 20 in your Bibles. Revelation 1, verse 20. It's just identified there what the seven stars are. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstand, Jesus is talking here, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So he, he's re-emphasizing here. I, I'm the one who holds the messengers in my hand. Uh, the angels of the churches. We've noted this throughout this series that that, I'm, I'm not going to repeat why, but we take that, I take that, as this is looking at messengers from each of these seven churches. They take a message from the church to John while he's on the Isle of Patmos. They bring back a message from John on the Isle of Patmos to these churches and the letter of Revelation. And Jesus specifically in each one of these situations is writing to the angel or the messenger of these churches. In some sense, the messenger represents the church. Uh, in some sense, it's directed just to the messenger. I, I'm going to bring out later in, in this letter, I think the focus is more on the church as a whole, but some kind of leadership in the church. Jesus reminds right off the bat, I hold these stars. Uh, I'm sovereign here. Whatever you're doing or not doing as a church, as a church angel, as a church messenger, uh, I hold you in my hands. You're responsible to me. That's, as we go through this letter, that's also very important to think through. Our next question. First, always our question is, what does Jesus say of himself? Second question. What does he commend? What does Jesus say good job to? Again, that's, that's really what we're looking for in this series. We want to identify what Jesus says good job to. So we as a local church, we can all, there is some objective characteristic or quality that's out there that we can be shooting for as well. And, and just looking at our, our church. Okay, are we like this? Are we not like this? So second question, as always, is what does Jesus commend? What does he say good job to? What does he say to Sardis? And this is one of those days where it's a rhetorical question, but you can shout out an answer if you desire. What does he say, good job, Sardis? Nothing. It's a trick question. <laughs> Nothing. He doesn't commend them for anything. That's, that's an awful thing to consider. The Lord of the church, 
the head of the church, the one who does have perfect knowledge of exactly what's going on in the church, individuals, hearts, motives, nothing. There, there's no commendation of this local church. It has nothing good to say about it. Um, only one other church in, out of these seven churches is it like that, and that's the church of Laodicea. That's the seventh church that we'll be looking at. So what does he commend? Nothing. What does he censure? That's always our third question. What does he censure? What does he say, I have this against you about? What does he say, bad job about? Still in verse 1. All this is very compacted in uh, this letter to Sardis. So here we are at our third question, and we're still in verse 1. Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. End of the verse. I know your works. What are they specifically? You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. What a thing to hear. Again, typically, throughout these letters, they're, they're, it's directed specifically to the angel or the messenger of this local church. Somehow, some way, he's in leadership. Somehow, some way, he represents that local church. Uh, and I, I think normally it focuses a little more to the reader side than the church as a whole side, although he represents the church. In this letter, I think the focus is more to the church as a whole side, but the leader is being addressed. Why is that important? Um, here in verse 2, look down to Revelation chapter 3, verse 2. This is important, remember, because I don't think Jesus is necessarily telling the leader, the messenger of this local church, you're spiritually dead. I don't think he's saying that to the leader of the church. Look at verse 2. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. Verse 1, he says, I know your works. Uh, you have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Now he's still talking to the same you here. In verse 2, he says, wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. Uh, I don't think this fits an individual. You can't be both dead and about to die as an individual. If, if you're dead spiritually, you're dead. It's not like, uh, have any of you ever seen the movie The Princess Bride? Okay. It, 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 it's not like the line from the movie The Princess Bride where Inigo Montoya says, he's dead, he can't talk. And then Miracle Max responds, woo-hoo-hoo, -hoo. look who knows so much. It just happens that your friend here is only mostly dead. There's a big difference between mostly dead and all dead. Mostly dead is still slightly alive. This is not how Jesus is speaking here in Revelation chapter 3. He's not talking about an individual messenger. Uh, you're either dead or you're alive. You're not mostly dead and slightly alive. If you're dead spiritually, you are dead. Uh, I, I think it just fits. He's, he's talking about the church. At, as a church, I'm talking to you as a whole you're mostly dead. <laughs> that means you are slightly alive as a church. There are some things that are there. Uh, look down to verse 4, where we, we see this re reference in the singular once again. So all these yous through most of this letter are you in the singular. You, one person. You or you as a whole church. That's how I take it here. You as a whole church. Look at verse 4. Chapter 3, verse 4. Yet you, singular, have still a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. So the you here much better describes the church as a whole. You as a church, you still have a few names there in Sardis. You still have a few people there in Sardis who have not soiled their garments. And they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. 
So again, I take it the you here is focusing on the church as a whole and not the messenger. Let's get back to the, the, the censure of Jesus, the condemnation of Jesus. The end of verse 1, chapter 3, verse 1. I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. So what would it mean for a church to be characterized as dead? Uh, Robert Thomas, I think, sums it up well. He writes this. He says, the Sardinian church was outwardly active, conveying the impression of liveliness. So nekros, that's the Greek word for dead here, root word. Nekros refers to an inward spiritual condition. Like the church, excuse me, like the city, the church was existing in the past, so to speak. Its fame and the ministry of its members for Christ in the past were the basis for its present reputation. They had made peace with the surrounding society and fit in comfortably with their culture. The offense of the cross in that community had ceased to exist. A state of spiritual death pervaded the church. They were void of real vitality and genuine fruitfulness. In this church and in the one at Laodicea, no foes of the churches are mentioned, either inside or outside, yet they are characterized as dead and lukewarm. The deadness and lukewarmness must have been self-imposed. So, again, we see this is the church as a whole. You're dead. That's how he describes them. Not every single member, though, is that way. Not every single person in the church is that way. We saw that in verse 4. Yet, there's some among you, there, there's some names there in Sardis in your church who are not that way. But as a whole, that's his description of this church. What's, what's the deadness look like practically? I, I take it the local church, as they're hearing this from Jesus, they wouldn't be wondering. I, I take it they would know but we have to kind of flesh it out from the context here. Look to verse 2. I I think the commands that Jesus gives to the church in light of what he says about it also tell us something of of how their deadness played out. Verse 2, Revelation 3, verse 2. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard Keep it and repent. Jesus gives five commands in two verses for this church that he says, you're dead. Wake up is first. And I think that's key when we're trying to figure out, well, how did this deadness look? What would we be looking at? Well, they were asleep also. That would be another way uh, to describe that. Uh, Robert Thomas, again, he says this about wake up. The call to be constantly alert was an invitation to a radical reversal of the Sardinian church's current attitude. Their complacency had lured them into surrendering their identification with Christ and his cause in favor of allowing their lives to blend more completely with their non-Christian surroundings. In essence... Their deadness was seen in their complacency to the world around them. They they fit in. They fit in just with the world. You couldn't see a lot of difference between the church now and the world around them anymore. Uh, They they just blended in with the word. And Jesus also says here among these commands, uh, repent, remember what you heard. And repent and get back to that. So it seems like they weren't following the Lord's commands anymore. They're just following what fit in with the world as a local church. I, I think certainly that's, that's a danger for all time, all churches. Uh, I think in our time, the great, the great danger, how, how you can, I don't know if I want to say become, but part of maybe being a spiritually dead church in light of this idea that you're just, you're just trying to fit in. Uh, 
the area of sexual ethics, I, I think, is uh, a, a big issue in the evangelical churches of today, where there was a time when many people had some basic Christian kind of background, and they would affirm basic Christian morals and that kind of thing. But now the world is increasingly hostile to that. And in the world, it's like uh, sexual immorality, that's not a bad thing, that's a good thing. Sexual intercourse with whoever, however, whatever, great, let's, let's push that. So churches, if they're kind of just trying to fit in, then they have to either downplay what the Bible says about sexual morality, or uh, even just start saying, well, you know, the most important thing is love. And that's what Jesus wants. So don't worry about sexual immorality or uh, who you have sexual intercourse with and that kind of thing. Just, just love them, and that's really what the Bible is about. And if you say that, you'll get a thumbs up from the world, and uh, you'll, you'll be a spiritually dead church. We don't want to be like that. And that's where it comes back to uh, with these commands that Jesus give in verses 2 and 3. Again, his first command is wake up. Uh, keep on watching for the dangers of the world that can infiltrate the church. But he also says in verse 2, and strengthen what remains and is about to die. So there, there's some spiritual residue, uh, Christian virtue in the church, Christian teaching. Strengthen that. That's one thing you can do. So first wake up, realize it is dangerous. Don't be asleep at the wheel. But second, there's still some Christian virtue there. Okay, strengthen that. Come back to that. Go back to that. Build that up. Don't let it slip along with everything else that you have through complacency. Verse 3. Remember then what you received and heard. This church had a gospel foundation. At some point, that's how it began. Remember this foundation again. Remember the importance of following Jesus' word and keep it once again. This is what you need to go back to as a church. Keep it. Uh, this is in addition to the gospel, I take it. This is Jesus' words as a whole. Remember in John 8, verse 31, Jesus uh, talked about abiding in my words. And in Matthew 28, when he gave the Great Commission, he says, okay, you make disciples, you baptize them, and then you teach them to observe all that I've commanded you. So we, what he's saying here, okay, first wake up, strengthen what remains, then remember, remember Jesus' words, get back to that once again, get back to the black and white, keep it, do it, live it out. We find Jesus' words in the Bible, in particular in the New Testament, and that's what we seek to go back to. That's, I think Leroy said earlier, our middle name is Bible as a church, Heartland Bible Church. Yes, that's why I love that name is, yeah, we realize the Bible is where it's at. That's where you hear God's word. That's where you hear Jesus' words. These are the things that we've heard and, and believed. Well, he's saying here to the church at heart, Sardis, get back there. Keep those things. Find out again, you know, the, the old radio program, back to the Bible. Yes, get back to the Bible Keep that. Go back there. Then Jesus adds the fifth command. Repent. It just naturally follows to whatever extent they're sinning in these areas right now. If they're going to keep these things that they had first heard and, and, the, ministry of the, and the ministry of the word of God that had been given to them, if they're going to go back to that, then they also have to repent and stop doing the things that they were doing as a local church. But at this point, since the church as a whole is characterized as dead, the warning Jesus gives is very ominous there in verse 3. End of verse 3. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Uh, this is just like Jesus' warnings of his imminent return to this earth. In, in his second coming, he talks about how he'll come like a thief in the night. 
Uh, I take it here, it's not talking about his second coming. I, I take it it's his coming in judgment to this local church. Because if this was talking about the second coming, then in a sense, the second coming would be dependent on this church in Sardis not waking up. Because Jesus says again, if you will not wake up, I will come like a thief. He's not saying that. He's not going to have his second coming depend on this church in Sardis. But in judgment for this church, Jesus says, yeah, if you won't wake up, if you won't follow the things I'm talking about here, I will come like a thief, and you won't know what hour I will come against you. Uh, R.C.H. Linsky, I try to always say this, we would disagree with him on the interpretation of Bible prophecy in general, but he does, he does say some good things, and one of those things is here. He says, in light of this warning of Jesus, he says this, when judgment comes, everything is too late. That's why right now, Jesus is saying right now, don't wait, don't wait, right now. Verse 4. Yet, you have still a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Okay, I've said this before. At the end of chapter 3 here in Revelation, we're going to come back to these promises like this, and promises to the overcomers. And uh, I, I guess that John Stott, I think, offers a sober conclusion to this letter to the church at Sardis. He says this, The reputation that Sardis had acquired was a reputation with human beings, but not with God. It was in the sight of God, Christ said, that he had found this church's works deficient, this distinction between reputation and reality, between what human beings see and what God sees, is of great importance to every age and place. Although we have responsibilities to others, we are primarily accountable to God. It is before Him that we stand, and to Him that one day we must give an account. He continues, we need to remember that the Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. 1 Samuel 16, verse 7. He reads our thoughts and knows our motives. So as we close this morning, we move from what Christ thinks of the church to what the Lord thinks of you. Verse 6. He who has an ear... Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is individual. Do you have an ear? Are you hearing this message? Before Jesus Christ, are your garments soiled or are you dressed in white? And maybe you're here this morning thinking, I don't have a clue what either of those things even mean. Well, first, all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. None of us measure up to what he commands. In that sense, all of us by nature have soiled garments. But turn over to Revelation 7, verse 14. Revelation 7, verse 14. As we think on how to get white garments and not soiled garments. This is a description of what's yet to come. And it's a description of, in the Great Tribulation, how many believers in Jesus Christ, almost every believer in Jesus Christ that will be in the Tribulation period will be martyred. Uh, but there's a phrase here that helps us understand something about soiled clothing and becoming white, having white clothing. Look at verse 14 of Revelation, verse 7. I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. That's how you get white garments. And I'll ask again, Are you dressed in white garments? Have you been washed in the blood of the Lamb? Well, how's that happen? 
That's just a very descriptive way of talking about have you received Jesus Christ as he's been offered to you in the gospel. That Jesus Christ has died for your sins on the cross and rose again from the dead. And what he did on the cross as he shed his blood for you on the cross, the sacrifice that he made for you on the cross, that results for all who will receive him, forgiveness of all sins, cleansing, being made white, your robes washed white in the blood of the Lamb. So I guess very bluntly, has there been a time in your life where you've received Jesus Christ as he's offered to you in the gospel, that he died for your sins on the cross and rose again from the dead? If you've never done so, then you're still in soiled garments, and then all the awful things that says to come in Revelation yet await you. But the good news is this morning you can receive him, and you can be washed, and you can have a white robe and not soiled garments. So that's my prayer for any who are watching and who are listening this morning. Receive the Lord Jesus Christ as he's offered to you in the gospel, that he's the king, and he's the king who died on the cross for your sins and rose again from the dead. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for even sobering words like this that we have to this church in Sardis. It's a reminder that you, you know what's going on in your church. You care what's going on in your church. And even when things are going really bad, uh, even to a church like this church at Sardis, you didn't just totally write them off. You gave them instruction. Okay, here's, here's what's going on, but here's what you need to do. Wake up. Strengthen what remains. Remember what you've previously heard and keep it and repent. So, Father, to whatever extent we as a church need to do these things, help, help us through your Holy Spirit. But especially if there be any among us this morning who have not yet cleansed their robes, that they've not been forgiven of all their sins, they've not been cleansed of all their sins, please, by your Holy Spirit, make that very real to them. Help them to know where they stand. And then, Father, uh, bring the good news of the gospel to their mind. That it doesn't have to stay that way. Christ died for their sins and rose again from the dead. And by grace, he can be received. And in being received, he grants forgiveness of sins, cleansing, everlasting life, and true change. So, if there's anyone here who's in that state, Father, help them to repent and believe in your Son, Jesus Christ, and be saved. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.